This is the BBC. This podcast is supported by advertising outside the UK. Ryan Reynolds here from Mint Mobile. With the price of just about everything going up during inflation, we thought we'd bring our prices down. So to help us, we brought in a reverse auctioneer, which is apparently a thing. Mint Mobile Unlimited Premium Wireless. How to get 30, 30, how to get 30, how to get 20, 20, 20, how to get 20, 20, how to get 15, 15, 15, 15, just 15 bucks a month? So Give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 up front for three months plus taxes and fees. Promote for new customers for limited time. Unlimited more than 40 gigabytes per month. Slows. Full terms at mintmobile.com. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Hello. I'm Sheila Dillon. Welcome to this edition of the Food Programme on lamb and hogget and mutton. What are they? And why the Easter tradition of eating lamb? Cardiff in spring. Trees, birds, and not far away. It's Easter Sunday, and although chocolate eggs and hot cross buns take centre stage this weekend, today millions of us will gather around the table with friends and family to share a joint of lamb. But why lamb on this day? Christians call Jesus the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, said John the Baptist, according to the New Testament. But does that mean we should actually eat lamb on the day of his resurrection? In spite of my Roman Catholic upbringing, it's a tradition I've never really understood. So with the birds singing and a food historian at my side, I've come to St Fagans, the Museum of Welsh Life, 20 minutes from Cardiff city centre, to learn some of the history of sheep farming in Wales and to find out how lamb became linked with Easter. St Fagans is an open-air museum spread over a hundred acres, scattered with buildings from all over Wales. Farmhouses and cottages, mills, a school, a working man's institute, a church, a chapel. They've all been brought from different parts of the country and rebuilt brick by brick or stone by stone to look as they would have done in their original settings. They also have a working farm, and as you can probably hear, it's lambing time. It's a real mix here, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So you've got Blackface Welsh Mountain and then Llanwenog, which is more of a lowland breed. I'm with writer and historian Carwin Graves, author of Welsh Food Stories. Tell us about the sheep and the Welsh, Carwin. I mean, has it always been a land of sheep? Yeah, it hasn't, it hasn't. I mean, sheep have been here for thousands of years, since the Stone Age, the Neolithic. But really, through most of history, there's much more of an association between whales and pigs and cattle than between whales and sheep. Not that sheep weren't here. They filled a different role in the economy. People did eat them from time to time, but it wasn't a mainstay of the diet. Lamb really is something that's come in in the last hundred years in a big way Just in Wales. Just hundred years? Yeah. If you think about sheep, there's three things you can get from a sheep. One of them is wool, the other is milk, and the other is meat. Now, these days, if you're raising sheep in Wales, it's probably for meat. But through most of the rest of history, it's been for the other two reasons. This programme going out on Easter Sunday, and a lot of people will have had lamb for Easter Sunday lunch. When did that happen, and why? Yeah, well, you know, lamb as as an Easter thing does go all the way back, and it's common across Europe and even into the Middle East. And there are records going back, I think, to the 10th century of the Pope having an Easter feast and eating lamb. Here in the British Isles, certainly it was something that was done, maybe by people who are higher up in the social hierarchy. But if you were, you know, normal everyday people, you probably wouldn't be able to afford lamb because you have to raise those sheep for your economic output, for particularly the wool. That's changed. Wool has lost value. Sheep have remained, you know, relatively easy to farm, and particularly here in Wales where there's plenty of poor uplands. And as one thing declined in importance, the other thing increased in importance, and lamb was always a higher status meat. It's tender, it was associated with the rich, and so when suddenly there was more lamb around, you have the sort of classic market change and then the supermarkets start growing and they see a way of creating a produce and pushing it, and our eating habits have changed with that. 
It's always seemed, I mean, as a child, it always, and it still seems to me strange that in a sense, you know, we talk about the Lamb of God and Easter and, you know, the crucifixion and the resurrection, and we eat lamb. Yeah. How does that happen? Yeah, I mean, we, we could go back to Judaism for this because Easter really sits on top of Jewish Passover feast. And that goes back to Moses and indeed to Abraham and stories around the Jews being delivered out of Egypt and the blood of a lamb being put above the doorposts in Jewish households so that the angel of death wouldn't visit them. So lamb is associated with death and life and being delivered. And then in Christianity, Jesus takes that symbolism on himself. And of course, you've got this whole idea in Christianity of communion of literally eating the body of Christ and the blood of Christ and Jesus calls himself the lamb of the world so there's a sort of almost like an extension theologically of the idea of communion and of eating and taking part I mean it just sounds so strange doesn't it (laughs) eating but taking you know partaking of the body of God together so it's something communal and blood is at the center but not originally in Jewish thought in a gory way but blood is the life force that runs through every being and in our secular country you have a leg of lamb and that's that but without any understanding of the symbolism Yeah, I don't know. I think there is still symbolism, isn't there? It's the same symbolism that was probably there right at the beginning, thousands of years ago, because of new life, because of, you know, I'm seeing that lamb pranking, we'd say in Wales, you know, pranking, just jumping about jolly, you know. And, And it is that sense we're coming out of winter, there's new life, there's innocence, there's hope. I don't know, I think that's still there somewhere, subconsciously maybe, as people, you know, eat an Easter leg of lamb together yeah, the strangeness of um sim- you know new life and that that little lamb over there just leaping in the air the way that lambs do and yet we're going to kill you <laughs> and we're going to kill you and we're going to eat you and we're going to kill you and we're going to eat you and we're going to be thankful maybe hopefully and it's going to feed us and that's the cycle isn't it of life and death the cycle of life and death food historian and author Carwin Graves. A cynic might say it's the supermarkets who should be most thankful for the survival of this symbolism. Easter brings a huge spike in sales of lamb, which for the rest of the year lag behind chicken, beef and pork. Market researchers Kantar said last year's Easter sales of lamb roasting joints were up 25% on 2022 sales. 93% of those roasting joints were legs. Time to speak to an old friend of the food programme. I met him a few years ago when he, with Prince Charles, as he then was, helped found the Mutton Renaissance campaign. Hello! Sorry, can you hear me? I had to go and get my coffee, I needed the the most important... Butcher farmer, market trader Andrew Sharp now teaches butchery at the School of Artisan Food. I asked him if what people are eating this Easter is really lamb. Well, therein lies a tale of old, you know, because previously what we would have been eating would be a milk-fed lamb, but today we've become used to lambs being fulfilled in 22, 24 kilos, and they are pushed on to be ready for Easter. It will have been a fairly big task this year because Easter's early, so that means the lambs are born before Christmas quite some time before, and we'll need you know, pushing on somewhat. When you say pushing on, what do you mean? I mean, feeding them and and they would be inside house, lambed inside and be finished, you know, cereal finished inside so that they're ready for the Easter market. I mean, a great product, don't get me wrong, that inside housing is not evil or, or, or bad. It's just a different style of system that people would expect it to be. But will they have had soya and, you know, that kind of feed? Well, it depends who you buy your feed from, Sheila. Um, (laughs) Some will, but a lot won't because they'll be feeding them things that I would hope and I I know to some extent don't contain those um, South American type of soyas. But, you know, like I say, it depends who you buy your feed from. Not all lamb on sale now is spring lamb. Lots will be meat from lambs born last year and are close to being hoggered. The Agriculture and Horticulture Development Board 
tells us the majority of UK lamb on sale is from animals born between January and April. Hoggett is meat from sheep around a year old when they've started to develop their adult teeth and fleece. Mutton is from a sheep more than two years old, usually a ewe that's been used for breeding lambs. But even if you're keen to try mutton, it's almost never available in supermarkets, and even good butchers often want notice before they'll get it in for you. Why is that? It's because, you know, you buy a sheep and it's like 100 quid or 150 quid for a sheep. I'm talking about mutton-wise. And you have to get lamb prices for everything. And people say, well, why would I buy that when I can buy lamb chops that I don't need to mess about braising or, you know, and, and it's a culinary ability because each breed has some level of nuance of difference. Well, when someone's taken the, the sheepskin off, the kind of knowledge goes a little bit and then it goes to a butcher that knows a bit less or a big processing plant where they say, it's just scraggy old sheep. And really, it's a superior product. That's the shoulder that's been out of the oven, came out about half eight this morning, went in about half ten last night. That is, that's pretty amazing. How, so what, that's mutton. It's 10 o'clock in the morning and I'm in Cardiff at the Spanish restaurant Asador 44 with owner Owen Morgan, being shown a shoulder of what some people might dismiss as a scraggy old sheep, an eight-year-old female. I mean, most people in Britain would say, well, that's not really edible. You know, no, that's... and when it came into us and I looked at the, but the, the butchery and the peak the shoulder, I was like, wow, look at the dark colour and marbling of that meat. I couldn't quite believe the quality. You know, when you Although know, Owen relishes mutton and hoggart, he's rarely able to put it on the menu. With mutton and hoggart, it's not just about the consumer, it's also getting hold of it regularly and regular supply. And it does command a premium. Some people think it should be cheap, maybe, but it's not. It's been reared for a long time. Yeah, I mean, that is, as far as we can see, that's one of the great drawbacks that people think, oh, mutton, you know, mutton dressed as lamb. It ought to be cheap. There's that generalisation and, and stereotype that, one, it should be cheap, and two, it's going to be tough and not particularly nice, but we need to continue to blow that out of the water, I think. We were talking earlier to someone who teaches butchery at the School of Artisan Food now, but he said there's just been such a decline in cooking skills at home, and you actually do have to take more care with hogget and mutton. Is that true? I think so. I think you need to know what you're doing. It does surprise me with the sort of food revolution that's gone on in the UK in the last 20 years. You turn on a TV any hour of the day and there's cooking of some form. You'd think there'd be an increased skill set again going into the home kitchen but maybe that is still more niche and as a general society we have lost basic skills and the age of convenience is still here and the age of lamb i mean we eat more chicken than anything else yeah and with lamb hoggett mutton in particular you are going up the age scale and then up the flavor level so i think almost mutton and hoggett allow you to do more with it in terms of flavour and experimentation, whilst keeping that beautiful flavour of the animal. One of the, th the things we gather from the meat marketing statistics is that younger people are not, they're not even eating lamb, let alone mutton and hogget. So are the young chefs in your kitchen, are they excited by mutton and hogget? Or, or they are. When it comes in, and it, because we're not using it every day, they're all like, right, oh, what's, in, what's in here? And so they are interested. I guess we have like-minded people in the kitchen already. Yeah. So equally, you say younger people aren't eating as much lamb, but I think it's the younger generation that are coming out to have an experience. I mean, in some funny way, you've got a whole generation of young people who care about the environment. And we have a, a long history here of the breeds that were bred for these particular conditions, the hills, yeah. the fells, the mountains, where you know they eat things that no other animal would eat, maybe goats. You know, maybe we should all be eating much less meat, but if you're going to eat meat, why not eat yes. these things? Yeah, and there still is a big disconnect, isn't there? Because I think it's like me bringing in um, certain wines into the restaurant at a certain price, and they would, they're a bit different, and they very much need hand-selling. And it's the same with products like this. 
you almost need time at the table with people. Change is happening, though. Carwin Graves told me about Welsh farmers who are producing hoggett and mutton and finding ready customers. That shoulder of eight-year-old you that Owen slow cooked came from Cornwall farmer Matt Chatfield, who set up the Cornwall Project to finish, as farmers say, ewes who are past breeding age. They put on fat and good taste, grazing under trees and on what's often called marginal land, land rich with herbs and wild flowers. The meat now goes to some of London's top restaurants. In Pembrokeshire too, first-generation farmer Steve Lewis, a finalist in last year's BBC Food and Farming Awards, is selling sheep meat of different ages in boxes direct to customers. It's a bit of a, a strange situation, really, because lamb is the easiest to sell in terms of people associate Welsh and lamb very quickly. Mm -hmm. But we would sell more boxes of hoggett and mutton because it tends to be for the people who have either a more discerning palate or they're a bit more adventurous and willing to try something a bit different. Perhaps it's a sign we're on the cusp of a revival for these slower-grown, longer-living types of meat. I asked Steve how he'd built demand for mutton and hoggett. It is about trying to communicate through social media. We've recently started a little pop-up shop at the end of the lane because we're, we're by a main road. So it's talking to customers that come in, in there. And first thing you say, you know, you mentioned hoggett. Oh, what's that? What's that? But once you get people to taste it, it's sold to them. Some people can be a bit daunted with the size of a joint or what do I do with a joint? So if you package it and say, well, look, here's mints, because you can do so many different things with it. You get elements of the different cuts all in one package. On your website and in the work that you do, you, you make a good case that you are running a sustainable farm. Does it make sense environmentally to keep lambs to an older age if they're then eating more and producing more methane? One thing I will say before I answer the question properly is just last week, Pembroke Shalam has actually become a B Corp. So we've been through a verification to show that we are reaching standards of trying to do better with our business. So you can't be perfectly sustainable. So you can do the best that you can and no more. So what we do is when we look at any management decision, we think, right, what is the most sustainable option? Now, Whilst I appreciate that if you have an animal on the farm for the least amount of time, it's going to produce the least amount of methane. But another way of looking at it is if I have that lamb on the farm for a short period of time, it's going to yield me maybe 16, 18 kilos of meat. If I keep that lamb longer, it could yield me 25 kilos of meat. So then the conversation comes around to, well, what's the most efficient? Well, genetics in college a younger animal will always grow faster but to get that young animal to grow fast you're going to rely on giving it concentrate feed especially this time of year we haven't got the grass for that animal to eat to grow at a natural rate then the question comes in well what's the carbon footprint of that product that i've got to feed to that animal so when we started permanent lamb it was like okay well how can we work with nature as best we can. So the lambs for our meat boxes won't start being born until Easter. So as soon as they, the lambs go out, they're on just grass all the way through. So the lambs will never eat concentrate feed. Farmer Steve Lewis. Right now, sheep farmers are getting good prices, partly because this year, Easter coincides with the Muslim holy month of Ramadan. But as Awal Fuseini, senior halal manager at the Agricultural and Horticultural Development Board, says it's not just Ramadan. Muslim customers are enthusiastic buyers of lamb and mutton all year round. Muslims account for 20% of the total lamb that is consumed in England, 
We also know that the Muslim consumer absorbs almost all the mutton that is produced in the UK. If we look at uh, frequency of consumption, 62% of Muslims consume lamb at least once a week against 6% of the general population. So these, these figures are emphasizing how important the halal market is to the sheep industry in the UK. They buy so much mutton, says Awal, because they know how to cook it. So many Muslims spend more time in the kitchen cooking the product for longer time compared to the general population. If you look at the general population, many people want to go to the kitchen and, and spend as less time as possible, but the cooking style of many Muslims is suited for mutton. Back at Owen Morgan's Cardiff restaurant, the mutton shoulder is ready. You don't need extravagant accompaniments to that. In Spain, you'd have a lovely crisp salad with that, something with a sharp based vinaigrette or just oil and vinegar, just to cut through that. There you go, there's your lunch. It was a real feast. Owen and head chef Paul turned the hogget from Steve at Pembrokeshire Lamb into meatballs in a spicy, smoky tomato sauce, burgers with a garlic sauce, and a steak grilled simply and served pink. It's so much more tasty than lamb. I mean, it's a reminder of something we don't eat very often. Right. It's wonderful. I mean, I don't know what, see what you think. We'll dive into this now. Yeah. The, the flavor difference. Yeah. And that's unadorned. All we did with that is put some sea salt on it and put it on the grill. And that's a leg just cooked as a steak, rested pink. That's, that's, that's beautiful that's for me. Lesser. That's really interesting, the Pembrokeshire hoggart. Could anyone at home give hoggart and mutton a go? Definitely. Well, why not? You know, everyone's got a store cupboard full of herbs and spices they don't use enough. And things in their fridge as well. And I, I don't think, I'm now also thinking about lovely little dips like tzatziki and using things like natural yogurt. And at home you could use pasta with that. You could do a bake of that with lovely cheese and breadcrumbs on top. And that's a family meal midweek using meatballs and if it's available why wouldn't you and something with something something with yeah something with so much flavor Mm. is going to go much further you could cook three days meals with it in different ways you know chef and restaurateur owen morgan during our day out at the museum of welsh life Carwin Graves and I walked to the extraordinary Unitarian Chapel, built in 1777 and moved on site from Carmarthenshire in the 1950s. What a building! You wonder when that oak started growing before it was felled. Looking around at the chapel and the whole collection of buildings at St Fagans is a reminder of the vast changes we've seen in this country over the last century, particularly in the way we produce our food. Without being sentimental, Carwin raises the question of how we can use the past to develop a system where more people can afford to eat meats that are grown more slowly and where every part of the beast is used something that's actually beginning to happen in the dairy industry. It does seem a strange madness that wool prices are now so low, and have been for a long time, that some farmers use it as winter bedding for their animals instead of straw. If we had an economy where farmers were able to raise sheep for wool and there was a supply of mutton, I think we would find that it would be a lot more accessible and affordable than the current situation where it's only really lamb you can get um, in shops locally. It's quite easy for us to just settle into ideas that, oh, well, people don't want this. But actually, maybe they do. Maybe these days people are really willing to try something that they haven't tried before. So, if you do eat meat, and I know many of you do not, but if you do, give mutton and hoggett a try. Eating just lamb, after all, is a bit like eating only veal and barely touching beef. You'll have to ask for it in your butchers if you're lucky enough to have one, or in your supermarket. Maybe it's time to give customer power an outing and see what happens. Meanwhile, happy Easter. And we have some news. 
The food program has a new long 45 minutes instead of 28 slot in the Radio 4 schedule. Friday at 11 o'clock, directly after Woman's Hour, repeated on Saturday evening at 10.15, and of course, always there on BBC Sounds. For our first long episode, Leila Kazim is joining Gary Lineker in his kitchen. Did you know he was a serious cook? I didn't. Anyway, that's Gary Lineker and Leila Kazim this Friday at 11 o'clock for a big cook-up and some serious food thoughts. But if you're unchangeably wedded to listening to the food programme as you prepare Sunday lunch, and why wouldn't you be, you still can. You simply play it directly from BBC Sounds. Thanks for listening. Producer Natalie Donovan and I hope you got as much out of it as a listener as we did putting it together. St Fagans is an outstanding museum. Owen Morgan is one of the very best chefs in Wales. If you want to learn how to butcher... Andrew Sharp is your man, and Carwin Graves is a remarkable writer. Get hold of his book, Welsh Food Stories. You'll love it. Hi, this is Kirsty Young. I just wanted to let you know that Young Again, my podcast for BBC Radio 4, is back. I'm telescoping two bits of the story together. That's OK. It's only memory. <laughs> it's only show bits. We can say what we like. In Young Again, we're joined by some of the world's most intriguing people. Bill was the CEO at Microsoft at the time. And I ask a simple question. If you knew then what you know now, what would you tell yourself? Be very, very careful about the people you surround yourself with. I gave too much power to people who didn't deserve it. Subscribe to Young Again on BBC Sounds. I'm looking forward to your company. 